Well, there's nothing wrong with clapping for that. Um, like good music. I'm kind of lucky that we do have so much of her stuff recorded. Um, not as much as I'd like now, but, you know, hey, it is what it is. So um, open your Bible to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. My, uh, my text is going to be here in, verse, in chapter number 20, and then we're going to go to chapter number 32. <coughs> Exodus chapter 20, verse number 3, this will be the text this morning, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's pretty simple, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Our Father and our God, I come before you this morning, Lord, and you know my still recovering from being sick. Lord, I pray you'll please help me. Lord, I pray for our time that we have this morning. I thank you for those that are here. I pray you'll please give each and every single one of them a special blessing for making the effort to be in your house this morning. Lord, I pray for those that, uh, that this message will do what you would have it to do. I pray you'll meet with us this morning and that your will will be done, that no one will leave this house today without doing whatever it is you would have them to do. I pray you'll please give me strength and guidance and direction in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's a pretty simple verse, I think. Uh, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I think God was pretty specific. I think he was pretty to the point. And uh, let's just go over here to Exodus chapter 32. And we see that the children of Israel weren't very smart. They were actually quite dumb. So if we go over here to Exodus chapter number 32, let's look here. It was start at verse number 1. I've used these scriptures before, but we're going to use them a little differently this morning. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, see, Moses was up in Mount Sinai getting the commandments from God. He was the first person to download data from the cloud onto a tablet. Okay, at least Johnny got it. That was funny. And when, and, when, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up! Boy, they're, they're pretty uh, bossy, weren't they? Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. Well, we know what happened. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Well, that's a pretty, uh, pretty rough story, isn't it? And when Aaron saw it, he built an alt altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Now we know what happens. The children of Israel were terrible. Moses was up on the mountain. He was getting all this information from God. They had seen all these mighty things happen at the hand of God coming up out of the land of Egypt. And the children of Israel, after a short span of time, decided, well, I guess God ain't real no more. After all the things they saw God do to bring them out of Egypt, they already wanted a false god. So they went to Aaron, who was uh, Moses' kind of weaker brother, and said, hey, you, get up, make us a god. And what did he do? He said, okay, bring me all your gold and I'll do it. Well, he was smart, wasn't he? So the Bible says here, go down here, and the Lord said unto Moses, go Get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, 
have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of, the, out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have, wor and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now we see, if we just go down here a few verses, that uh, God wanted to uh, kill all the people of Israel over that. And Moses begged God not to let it happen. So that was kind of interesting, uh, all these things. In verse number 14, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So Moses left. <laughs> Look here, verse number, let's see, 18. And he said, this is when him and Joshua were coming up out of the mountain. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands, and he brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Isn't that interesting? He wasn't very tolerant, was he? And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? Now, if we remember earlier in the chapter, all they did was say, Hey, Aaron! Look, get up. Hey, make us a God. They didn't hold a gun to his head. They didn't threaten to kill his wife. They didn't do anything like that. They just said, hey, Moses is gone. Make us a God. They didn't really have to convince him very hard, did they? I've always thought this is interesting, uh, what Aaron said. And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. He just watched Moses throw stone tablets down onto the ground and he destroyed that golden calf, right? <laughs> Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. Well, we kind of figured that out, haven't we? For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. So he's telling this, the truth. I'll give him that. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast it into the fire. Look at that last sentence. And there came out this calf. Aaron was lying. Aaron turned it into a mystical thing that happened there. Because if we look back earlier in the chapter, we see that Aaron took a tool and he made the calf. He spent the time to make it. Well, when Aaron is talking to Moses, he said, well, I took all this gold from these people, I threw it in the fire, and out popped the golden calf. Aaron was full of it, wasn't he? Yep. He was completely and totally lying. So we know what happened, and then later in that time frame that lots of people uh, died because God is jealous. Look at verse number 35 of that same chapter. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf, which Aaron made. See, the, the, uh, the text in Exodus chapter 20, verse number 3, was what? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We all know this story. We've heard it. Some of us have heard it ever since we were kids in Sunday school. Almost everybody knows the story of the golden calf. It's been in movies. It's been kind of popular culture for generations. Yet we ignore it. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Because later in that, in that, in that uh, account, Moses asks a question. He asks who was on the Lord's side. And that's usually where 
where I, what I've used in the past. But this morning we're talking about the golden calf. Matthew chapter 6. I want you to look at verse number 21. Jesus himself said, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So I have a question. I have a very important question I guess I could ask you this morning. What is your golden calf? Think about that for a second. What is your golden calf? God himself said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And we see that the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 32, after all the mighty things they saw God do for them, after the angel of death had killed all the firstborn Egyptians, they've seen the, the, the plagues of Egypt. They've seen the, uh, the pillar of smoke in the daytime, in the pillar of fire at night, all these beautiful things that God has done for them, and they automatically turned to an idol. So let's look at that today. What is your idol? The Bible says Jesus himself said there at verse number 21 of Matthew chapter 6, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Galatians chapter 5, see, uh, idolatry is not something that is relegated just to the children of Israel. It is something that has to do with all of us. So in Galatians chapter 5, look at verse number, let's say, 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Now we're going to read through this and... Most of these are pretty rough. Adultery, fornication, and cleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's a long list of some pretty ugly stuff. But as we see right there in the middle, verse number 20, the first word is idolatry. Let me ask you a question. What can be an idol? Anything. Go back to Matthew chapter 6. Because I think one of the things that we struggle with as Christians today is idolatry. And it's not necessarily a thing. It could be a person. So let's look here back in Matthew chapter 6. Well, we're going to read a couple of verses here. Uh, verse 22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. So when we see Jesus is talking here after saying, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He says, let your eye be single. We should have one track vision. Our vision should be one track and that track should be God. How hard is that to do? We can be honest. Is that easy to do? No, it's not. Right now, we are surrounded by everything that wants our attention. What is your focus right now? Money. It's real easy to focus on money, especially when inflation is so high and money doesn't go half as far as it used to go. But is your focus money? Is your focus fun? Is your focus pleasure? 
Is your focus yourself? Is your focus your children? See, Jesus said that if your eye is single and is focused on the light, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. <coughs> what makes something evil? Think about that. Is this church evil? No. The moment it becomes more important than God, it is. Are you evil? If you're saved, you're righteous. But the moment you become more important than God, you've become evil. Are your kids evil? <laughs> As Johnny says, yes. <laughs> the moment your child becomes more important than God, that becomes evil. You might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. We'll go to Matthew chapter 10 real quick. Because we can put anything above God. All it takes is for us to worry more about them than God. Matthew chapter 10, look at verse number 34. Jesus himself said, Think not that I, come, I am come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. How many times do we put stuff ahead of God? How many times do we put people ahead of God. Well, you might say, well, sometimes this actually, that actually offends people. <laughs> They're like, well, I got to love my kids more than myself. I got to love my kids more than anything else. I got to love my wife. I got to love my husband. What we don't realize is the more we put God first, the better we can love everything else. And that is is the truth. If we put God first, we will be a better parent than we ever could be by not putting Him first. Let me ask you this. Do your kids benefit from a godly parent or from one that worships them? Right now, we live in, in a society, and it's unfortunate, but it's kind of the natural progression because humans are selfish. We're all selfish. We're all human. We're all selfish. Where society is pushing the idea that we must follow self. We must love ourselves above everything else. We see that in the, uh, all the gross movements that are taking over our families and our children. Right now, there's a, um, I don't want to call her a lawmaker, but there's a crazy lady in Virginia. <laughs> she wants to make it illegal for parents to uh, go against their kids' gender identity. That means, that, Brother Johnny, that they want to say that, well, you know where that's going, and it's disgusting. Why? Because they want to worship self. The world has gone insane. They want to worship self over the Creator. Go to Romans chapter 1. 
See, the children of Israel, they were worshiping themselves. Yes, they made old, old weak Aaron make them a golden calf, and you know they wanted to dance around naked and, and be gross and disgusting, and they pushed God to the point where God was going to just wipe them all out right then and there and say, I'm going to start over with you, Moses. But where are we at today? How close are we to that? Romans chapter 1. We're going to read through a few different verses here. Because <coughs> this is actually referencing that situation and the difference with the children of Israel. Professing, verse number 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. How many times have we heard somebody say, I can be as close to God on the mountain as I can in church. I've heard people say that all my life. I can be closer to God hunting than I can be in church. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. How many of us put other things before God? This says right here that they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. How many of us have stopped to realize that God is uncorruptible? No matter how much we try and bring Him down and make Him just as weak and insignificant as, of, uh, as us, it doesn't work. It cannot happen. God is uncorruptible. God is unable to be brought down to our level. He had to send His Son to die just to bring us to His. But how many of us change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things? Isn't God more than all those things? Isn't God all-powerful? Isn't He everything? But instead, we've tried to bring him down to our level and say that he's the man upstairs. How many of you ever heard God called the man upstairs? That's pretty corrupted, isn't it? We hear that in TV all the time. But I think that's one of the things that's where it started. Was they started talking about God like he was just the guy upstairs. He's not. He's the uncorruptible, all-powerful God. And he said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Verse number 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Does that not sound like us today? It says, who changed the truth of God into a lie. Right now, they want to say that there's no such thing as truth. Yeah, I know, it's hilarious. But they literally want to say that truth is subjective. Derek, your truth is going to be different than my truth. Supposedly, that's what they want to say. Johnny's truth is different than Sister Liz's truth. Who's different than Sister Wonky's truth? Who's, which is different than Sister Arlene's truth? Which is different than Sister Berta's truth? Which is different than Brother Jim's truth? That's not how it works. The truth of God is one way and one way only. Amen. But they've changed that. It says that turn the truth or change the truth of God into what? who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. <clears throat> you know, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, when your eye is single, when your focus is on Him, 
it lights up your whole body. It lights up your entire life. Everything is better. But instead, we as humans, we change the truth of God into a lie. And we worship ourselves more than we do Him. Look at what it says. It gets worse. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. <laughs> That's us today. That's our society today. One of the most basic truths of God is the family. It's the most basic truth. The father, the mother, and the children. But society has changed that into something that doesn't even resemble what it used to. The family has been destroyed. And with the destruction of the family has become the destruction of society. It's pretty disgusting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, mal maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. We have made the creature more important than the Creator. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Jesus said, where your heart is, there your treasure shall be. Have we ever considered that if we put God first more, our life would be so much better? It's not that difficult. Put God first and guess what? He'll take all good care of you. It takes time. Because guess what? When you put God first, the devil's going to be there saying, well, no, it's not really going to work. It's not really going to work. He's going to be telling you, but no, there's all these other things you want to go do. You don't need to go to church. You can go do this, that, or the other. And it's real easy to listen to him. Very easy to listen to him. But what, what, what do we gain when we put other things before God? What do we honestly gain? Do we gain some fun or some, uh, some pleasure here on this world? In this world, I should say. Sometimes. But Jesus asked a rich man, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What can God help you with? Can he help you with everything? then why don't we put him first? Why do we choose that golden calf of whatever it is? Why do we do that? It's so much easier to choose the devil over the God. And you know, I probably have, I have my own golden calf. We all do. I have to be able to admit that. 
I have to be able to try and cast down my own golden calf and put God first. It's a daily task. It's a lifetime of effort. But my friend, I tell you, it's worth it. Because all of these things that we struggle with every day, bills, uh, health, um, family trauma, family drama, I mean, you name it, everything we go through, every problem we have has one solution. God. Now, now a lot of people will say, oh, that's cliche. <laughs> Everybody says that. You know, we're all sport, you know, that you're a preacher, you're supposed to say these things. Yeah, I am supposed to say these things. Because the Bible says it. And if the Bible says it, then it must be true. Because they want to say that this book is a lie. And when we look here, uh, what verse was it? Let's see. Verse 25 of Romans chapter 1, it says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. This is the truth. Amen. And this has been changed into a lie out there. And that's where we have to make the decision to look at this as the truth. We have to make the conscious choice to put God first. Go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. <coughs> whatever, whatever your golden calf is, is probably that first thing that either first thing that popped into your head when we started talking about it, or the one thing that keeps popping into your head and you keep getting mad about. <laughs> hey, guess what? I've sat out there before too, and I've heard stuff from up here that I really didn't like, and I know how it feels. Guess what? That one thing that's sitting right here or right here, and it's bugging the tar out of you, guess what? Get rid of it. Amen. I don't care what it is. Get rid of it. Amen. That's all you got to do. And once you get rid of that golden calf, guess what? God can use you more than you've ever imagined. But you've got to be willing to get rid of it. I don't know what it is. Quite frankly, I should be more worried about what my golden calf is than what your golden calf is or yours. Because whatever it is that's between you and God is between you and God. That's pretty simple. That was for free. All right. First John chapter two. <coughs> Let's look here. This is pretty simple stuff. First John chapter two, verse 15. Love not the world. Well, there you go. Case closed, right? <laughs> Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's kind of scary. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, there's a lot of people that will use that verse and they'll say the, you know, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. It's only one thing. They always refer to sexual stuff. Guess what? That's not just it. The lust of the flesh. What's the lust of the flesh, Brother Johnny? Things that make you feel good. Or keep you awake. Coffee. Look at that, Brother Johnny. You got coffee this morning. He's got it right there in his little cup. How many of you like coffee? How many of you like Mountain Dew? The lust of the flesh, right? Let's see, what else we got here? 
and the lust of the eyes. Everybody always, and you know, you guys have been in church, you know, we've all been in church a lot. Everybody always gets to the lust of the eyes and says, that's when a guy looks at a pretty girl. Yes, that can be part of it. Duh, that's one. That nice sword. Hey, don't you look at my truck. <laughs> but you're right. It's that brand new truck they've got over at Don Chalmers for $120,000. What is wrong with these people? It's, it's, it, their truck costs more than my house. Well, you know, <laughs> then we got poor homeless brother Johnny. No. But what does this say? For all that is in the world, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, whatever it is that you want as a human more than you want God has become a lust of the flesh. doesn't matter what it is. Even if by itself it's not bad. Coffee's not bad. But if he had a little shrine in his closet, here we go. So he has a little shrine. He's got his little, little, little altar, uh, little bench, right? He's got a little golden coffee bean sitting up on a shelf. And he goes in there and he says, oh, Folgers in, in uh, let's see, Mac Maxwell House. That was another one. Uh, Starbucks. Starbucks, all hail the bean of Starbucks, da, 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 da. Circle K coffee. Circle K. Oh, that, that club is, you know, that saves you money. Um, anyway, is that, can that make coffee evil? It can. Now, I don't know anybody that worships coffee like that. But it's a stupid example. But can you put anything else in that kind of a position? Yes, you can. Sleep. Huh? Did you just say the Cowboys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think of people in the Cowboys. I, I, they, they, they're, you know what? You've got to... He, he said it. <laughs> All right? Can you put a football team above God? Johnny said it. I didn't. But he's right. You can. How many of you have seen those people that they paint their faces the colors for their team and they're out there with their shirt off and their body painted and they're like, ah, go Broncos, or whatever. And it's four below. Yeah, I, I've always loved that one. Oh, we can't come to church, but they can go sit at Soldier Field in Wisconsin at negative five below to watch a football game. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's called a DVR record. <laughs> called a DVR record. And a heater <laughs> and a blanket. <laughs> all right. <laughs> For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. All of this junk that we put before God, it's not going to last forever. None of it is. People die. Cars break. Money becomes worthless. But God lasts forever. All we have to do is cast down our golden calf. We have to figure out what's more important to go than God to us. And then go back to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. 
If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Don't you want to be full of light this morning? Imagine all of those things that you struggle with, that I struggle with, that can be solved if our body is full of that light. When we put God first, He cleans up our body. He cleans up our soul. He cleans up our lives. He will remove those things that are in our life that bring us away from Him if we just let Him. It doesn't matter what we have trouble with. Guess what? God can fix everything. We just have to put Him first. God can make sure we always have the money we need to pay our bills. All we have to do is put him first. Now, that doesn't mean God's going to make us uh, uh, Jeff Bezos. He's very rich. <laughs> but he'll take care of us. God can fix our marriages. God can fix our kids. God can fix our homes. God can fix everything that we struggle with. All we must do is get rid of our golden calf and put him first. Amen. So what is your golden calf this morning? There's been something pop into your head. It doesn't matter what it is. I don't care what it is. God does. Leave it on the altar this morning. Just get rid of it. And you know what? When you, when you come up here and say, God, here's my golden calf. When you get up and you start to leave, you're probably going to take it back with you. Do it again later. Amen. Keep giving it back to God. Keep giving it back to God. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. And sometimes it's going to suck. Guess what? Keep giving it to God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Whatever it is this morning, I don't know what it is. I don't have a, a telescope. I'm not watching you in the middle of the night trying to figure out what you're doing that you shouldn't be doing. I don't care. It's not up to me. But you know what it is. Maybe you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning. That's the ultimate way to get rid of the golden calf of self, is to accept Jesus Christ this morning. If you were to die today, where would you go? If you can't answer heaven right now, then come get saved this morning. Maybe there's lots of things going on in your life. Maybe you have anxiety. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe there's financial trouble. I don't know what it is. God can fix it. But you've got to put him first. He won't force you. It's between you and God. Our Father and our God, I come before you this, this morning, Lord, and I don't know who needs to do what, only you do. Lord, I pray, Lord, that your, your spirit will move this morning and that any decision that needs to be made will be made for your honor and your glory and for the, the lightning, Lord, of our, of our lives, that we might serve you, that we might do better. So, Lord, I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody here that needs to make a decision, I pray that they will this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. As music begins to play, we have a little bit of time. The altar's open. If you need to come make a decision, come make that decision this morning.
bud. I thought you were past that stage in your life. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what is it a midlife crisis you're saying? <laughs> like your second child or something? I don't know. I don't mind being old. It's not fun. I know, Johnny. <laughs> All that gray. I ain't far behind, though. I know that. All right, let's stand. Protect us as we go home. Help us have a good day, Lord, and help us to remember as we, we leave this place that we should put you first in everything we do. Pray you protect us as we go home. Bring us back tonight safely. In Jesus' name, amen.